This program is proudly brought to you by Intuit, powering prosperity around the world. As we sit in the early innings of the AI revolution, it's clear artificial intelligence is and will continue to transform our daily lives. But its success depends greatly on the fuel behind it. In other words, the data. AI learns by deciphering patterns from large sets of data, making it one of the hottest commodities around. But there are challenges and limitations. Good data can be hard to come by. And as AI begins to touch all parts of business and industry, concerns over privacy and ethics are becoming part of the global conversation. Hello and welcome. On this episode, we'll take a deep dive into data and explore why improving algorithms and data sets will set Canada's AI industry apart. To get started, I'm joined by Charles Egan, Chief Technology Officer at BlackBerry. Charles, how is BlackBerry honing algorithms and data sets to improve AI? The cyber threat is really amplifying as more things become connected. There's fewer and fewer cyber professionals that are out there to deal with these uh, onslaught of cyber threats that are increasing. And AI and ML is, is really needed to leapfrog and give us solutions to have any hope of keeping up with the threats. So, so we really think that getting, getting good, good data sets for applying machine learning and artificial intelligence to give us the security edge that we need is absolutely vital. BlackBerry's mission to reinvent itself is well known. You've mentioned some examples of how you're using artificial intelligence. What are some of the hurdles and key challenges you face in using the technology? Well, it's some of the, the traditional ones, and we really are focusing on the security aspect of AI and ML. It's such a big space with natural language and, and other types of you know, more higher, higher level functions. But you know, the challenge is getting, getting the right data sets trained. And, and you know, there's, for example, we could have millions of features on a file. How do we do the feature reduction to really be able to accurately determine to a 99.9% .9 degree of accuracy that this is malicious or this is okay. And then how do you deal with false positives and false negatives? Uh, you know, making sure the data is, and the model are working to the level where they need to, to be deployed in the wild, I think is something that we're, we're always focused on honing and improving that. CEO John Chen has said, BlackBerry intends to be the world's largest and most trusted AI cybersecurity company. So what are you doing specifically to achieve this goal? We're really focused on creating a, uh, I call it a six-walled safe. You can have a very good security solution to protect one particular attack vector. We, we've created sort of a platform that allows you to create, cover all the sides of the threats. And, and you know, that includes the connected automobile moving forward. You know, we're also trying to make it so you don't need a PhD in cybersecurity to use our solutions. You've probably heard of zero trust networks where you you assign trust for a period of time and then you take it away so you don't leave vulnerabilities. We also have something we call zero touch. We want it to be easy and natural to use because humans will find a way around things if given an obstacle. So we're really focused on that, but we're really focused on the platform and highly effective models to protect people. BlackBerry's QNX has become the standard for car operating systems. So how are you using AI in vehicles? This is an exciting new area because the car is really becoming a mobile server over the next five years. So a lot of the techniques that we've deployed in our networks, we can apply in the car. So BlackBerry Ivy is something that is, that is new, which is the ability to apply AI and ML on the edge of the, in the car itself so that you can apply the insights locally and you don't have to count on everything going to the cloud. It could be personal data uh, exposure or it could be the round trip time or the processing time. So it, it really is unleashing the ability to use machine learning on the on the sensors in the car to create insights. You know, you could have a pressure sensor on the seat and a camera or an audio sensor, synthesize all that information together and say, there's a driver with a child in the back seat that isn't wearing a seatbelt, for example, and you could notify or apply some higher level insights right in the vehicle. Charles, really appreciate you taking the time. D2L, previously known as Desire to Learn, was founded in 1999 by engineering student John Baker. 
Fast forward 22 years and D2L is transforming education all over the world. From kindergarten to higher education, healthcare, government and the corporate sector, the company leverages AI and machine learning to help get the best outcomes for its students. Baker says in order to achieve the best results, the best data is key. Get the right data, that informs the, applying the right machine learning uh, algorithms, if you will, to, to, to solve the challenges that you're you're facing. In our case, you know, we're, we're trying to leverage uh, these types of AI models at, at cloud scale. So being able to pull in the machine learning that might be built by Amazon or Google or others and apply that to the data that we have. So a great example would be use machine learning to close caption videos automatically so that, you know, no matter uh, what language, up to 14 different languages, we, we caption, put that captioning attached to the video automatically into the system so that someone doesn't have to do that themselves. That's a great example of machine learning saving, saving time, if you will, for folks using the platform. By honing algorithms and improving data sets, the company has been able to make sure students don't fall behind as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. As you can imagine, during COVID-19, there's been a lot of learning loss where millions of students have been out of school. Uh, and it's an opportunity for us to use this technology now to catch them back up, get them on the right track for success because you know, the alternative is that they get you know, left behind. They fail a grade or they don't progress. Uh, and we want to be able to leverage this technology now to help millions of people do better with their lives, achieve their dreams. For more on how data will define the future of AI, I'm joined by Alexander Wong, Canada Research Chair in AI and co-founder of Darwin AI. Catherine Hume, Interim Head at Borealis AI, and Steve Osterino, VP of Development, Data and AI, and Canada Lab Director at IBM. Steve, why is it so crucial for companies to hone and focus algorithms for artificial intelligence? For the most successful companies, they're really the ones that are uh, embarking in this journey to artificial intelligence. And the reason is artificial intelligence gives you a way to use your most important asset, which is your data, to leverage that and build intelligent insight to really better your business, right? The way artificial intelligence uh, works, it really uses your data that you have, your historical data, feeds that into mathematical algorithms, and then allows you to make predictions so that you can actually kind of predict the future of what's gonna happen. So it's very important for us to keep focusing on that and being able to drive more insight, more intelligence, and, and better ourselves in the industry for ourselves and for our, our customers. So essentially, Catherine, it all comes down to the data. Is there too much data to handle and keep up with making useful, accurate algorithms that can be commercialized and scaled? As Steve mentioned, basically with artificial intelligence algorithms, we're developing that intelligence based upon past trends and data. And to a certain extent, you can say, we could never have too much data because the more data that we feed into an algorithm, the more patterns and intelligence that we can pick up and therefore the smarter the algorithm could become. So one example is if we think about the internet and even all of the pictures of cats on the internet, algorithms are really great at saying this is a cat and not a dog because they've seen so many pictures of both cats and dogs and they can recognize the difference. On the flip side, um, not all data actually leads to intelligence. So we have to be really careful in designing the algorithms so that they're actually picking up the signal and not getting lost in the noise. Alex, there are a lot of concerns about personal data and privacy. Will new regulations to protect privacy limit the scope of what can be done with data for AI purposes? And while new regulations to protect like privacy with, uh, will indeed limit the potential scope of what can be done with AI uh, for our AI purposes, it's very important to remember that this is done in a very good way and that will, at the end of the day, really improve the competitiveness and lead to a wider use in uh, application of AI. And the reason for this is that there are just so many uh, incidents recently with uh, unchecked use of data for AI, such as unauthorized use for things like you know personal information, for creative predictive algorithms for law enforcement, that has kind of shaken the trust of the public, uh, I guess, uh, trust in AI to the point where there's a bit of a fear and worry. With a lot of institutes such as University of Waterloo, as well as you know, companies like Darwin AI, well, what we feel is that by having the right regulations in place, it really allows the industry to put in the rights and checks and balances and provide proper governance uh, to essentially win back trust of uh, the general public in how AI can assist them in their lives without violating their privacy. 
Steve, Ontario recently revealed a digital strategy with plans to launch a new data authority. What does that mean for AI companies in Ontario? We've been working uh, with the Ontario government for a very long time, in fact, over a century. Uh, and, um, you know, we're very excited about that. We're one of the uh, biggest development organizations in Ontario and in Canada. So we, we understand why the Ontario government is doing this. We actually don't know the details yet on how this is being structured, but we understand why it's being done. It's really about the trust, uh, privacy, and, and ensuring that, you know, we're doing right by leveraging AI to, to do the tasks that we need to. Well, Catherine, there have been a lot of concerns about bias in artificial intelligence. How can improving algorithms and data sets help make AI more ethical? So I like to think about it in just the, the general rule of thumb is that artificial intelligence systems assume that the future will look the past and potentially should look like the past. And often with social policies, we want the future to look different than the past, right? We want to work for better equality, more inclusion and diversity in our workplace and the society. It's, it's less even around the algorithms, but just a mindset to know that we have to be careful when we're deploying these algorithms, when we want, when we indeed want the future to look a little different. We have the opportunity to design these systems in such a way that we can identify bias. We can tweak around what we're, what, performance objectives we're looking for so that we're optimizing for fairness as opposed to only accuracy. And, you know, as, as mentioned before, we can really bake privacy into the design of our algorithms so that we're, it, we're, we're living our values while we build and use these technologies. Catherine, would an ethical AI framework stifle companies' ability to be globally competitive? I don't think it would. I actually think I can think of multiple examples where going back to, as I said, where, you know, the, the algorithms might assume the past looks like the, will look like the future and the future look like the past. Sometimes if we train an algorithm, say for a marketing use case, only on our past customers, we might be missing out on a subpopulation or a market opportunity that wouldn't exist if we don't modify the design to optimize for fairness and ethics. And so I think it's almost on the flip side, there's a way to view ethical design as inspiring more competitive um, practices. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. Well, that does it for this edition of the show. Be sure to join the AI conversation on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, and tune into our next episode when we'll discuss why researchers, technologists, and business leaders are turning the oil and gas heart of Canada into a global AI powerhouse. For more on the latest in business technology and innovation from around the world, log on to globalizemedia.com. Thanks for watching.